I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me here to give this talk. How do you advance the slides? So, uh, this question of allotropes versus novel agents, I think I'm in a difficult position. Some of your perception of an allotransplant may be that it is barbaric and crass and with short-term and long-term complications and very unpredictable. Where novel agents measure and rational, and even if it doesn't work, what's the harm? You can always try another one. So I hope by the end of this talk, I can uh, change your perception of allotransplant. And the question to ask really isn't one versus the other, but whether how you work together. So in the backgrounds, we know about 50% of patients with Hodgkin can relapse after autotransplant. And the median overall survival in that population is very short, only 2.4 years. And again, the median age is very young, 30 years. So that's a lot of life years lost. And allotransplant has been investigated in the past and with somewhat suboptimal results. You know, when they did a myeloablative condition regimen, the treatment-related mortality has been as high as 40%. And using reduced intensity, we were able to reduce the treatment related mortality down to about 15%, but relapse are still common afterwards. And it's been argued that it's only for a selected population, patients who are fit, patients who have donors available. And you do have complications such as acute and chronic GVHD, infections, VOD. So this is, these are some of the historical data at uh, transplant centers that publish results the majority of these are retrospective series with small number of patients. But you see that uh, the condition regimen very widely. Stem cell source could be peripheral blood or bone marrow, and could be also umbilical cords. You see that the non relapse mortality generally range from 13 to 20 percent at two to three years. Overall survival is usually really bad. Two to three years when 50 to 60 percent. However, the PFS. It's only around 20 to 30 percent at two years' time. And the study from EBMT quotes a five year PFS of 18 percent. Now, again, most of these are retrospective studies. And Dr. Moscow has already touched upon this uh, large prospective data done by the EBMT group, where uh, they took 92 patients, gave them, a, gave them DHAP, and went to a reduced intensity allo transplant. So, of the 92 patients, 78 out of 92 successfully went to a transplant. And the results actually, I would argue, are not bad. The non relapse mortality at day 100 is only 8%, and the one year 15%. And although the one year PFS is 48%, the four year PFS 24%, I would argue it's better than any other novel therapies out there that we know of. Um, and especially for the patient transferred in the CR, the one year PFS is very high, 71%, and the four year PFS is 43%. So that was a single arm study with no randomization and not comparing against the novel agents. So this is the other uh, Italian study that compared allotransplant versus conventional chemotherapy. This study was done from 2000 to 2008. So at that time, it was before most of the novel agents were available. But they looked at, with, uh, they looked at the patient who relapsed after allotransplant with the intent to allo transplant. So patients who were HLA type and had results available 30 days after relapse. And of the 185 patients, they found that 66% had donors and 34% did not have donors. And of the 122 patients with donors, 104 went to an allo transplant. The reason not going to transplant were either disease progression or patient choice. And only 20% of patients were actually transplanted CR. Results of that study show actually if you had a donor, uh, since it's intended to treat, even though not everyone did allo, that population that had a donor did much better than the population that did not have a donor. The two-year PFS was 39% versus 14%, and the four-year PFS 26% versus 11%. And of course, again, this was done in era without novel agent, but at that time, the comparator was a conventional chemo, and transplant arm definitely won out over conventional chemotherapy. And these are the PFS and overall survival curve, again, showing that the population with a donor went to allotransplant did better than the population without a donor. And that's, that's a study for all comers who went to transplant. Now, we know that we can select for patients with a better prognostic factor and predict for better outcome post-transplant as well. This is a study done by the EBNT and the Italian group looking at retrospect analysis, looking at all their patients who got allo transplanted. And a large cohort of patients, 462, 
And they found out that overall two-year overall survival rate was at 55%, and the five-year overall survival was at 32%. The risk factors were early relapse, stage four disease, bulky disease, uh, poor performance status, and also age growing equal to 50. And when you look at a patient that had no risk factors that were going to allo transplant, you can actually have a five-year overall survival of 62%. And I would argue that that's really excellent data for someone who failed an auto transplant. And for somebody who's greater than two risk factors, their five-year overall survival is poor at 12%. And you can use this to differentiate whether or not someone should go to allo transplant or not. Last but not least, there's data done by the WashU group looking at a meta-analysis of all the transplant studies out there. Uh, this included 38 reports and about 1,800 patients. And the primary endpoints were six months, one year, two year, three year, relapse three survival, and overall survival. And the prognostic factor they found was patients who were transplanted after year 2000 had a better six months and one year overall survival. And the patient transplanted in the CR also had better two year overall survival and also uh, one year relapse free survival. Again, showing that you can select for a patient with better outcomes uh, leading to allo transplant and also post transplant. And these are just the curves. Uh, again, showing that a patient who were transplanted after 2000, perhaps with better supportive technique and also actually better novel agent therapies, they did better than patients who were transplanted before the year 2000. Now, let's talk about the novel agents. And again, Dr. Moskow has presented most of this data. We all know that Brentasmazodin is antibody drug conjugated, targeted against CD30, and nivolumab and pembrolizumab are PD1 inhibitors. Um, so the data with brentuximab, as Dr. Moskowitz presented, um, is quite good. The response rate is high. And for all the patients on that pivotal study, the five-year overall survival is 41%, and the PF is 22%. So you could consider that kind of equal to the amount of transplant data out there as well. However, at the end of the study, only 15 patients were in remission. And of those, six had allo transplant, and nine had no further therapy. So really, truly, only nine patients you can really count are in remission without the use of allo transplant. So that five-year PFS without allo transplant is probably a little bit lower. Now, if you look at a patient transplant, or well, patient who achieved CR, that's a different story. The five-year overall survival is 64%, and PFS is 52%. And the median PFS and overall survival are not reached yet. But even in the CR population, you have four patients that went to allo transplant, and nine patients had no further therapy. So you can argue these numbers could also be a little bit lower as well. And as Dr. Masu has also alluded to, yeah, we do see a plateau effect in both overall survival and the PFS with um, brentaxlodidotin. However, again, both of these curves include the patient going on to allo transplant. Next, they used the nivolumab um, as a PD-1 inhibitor. This was presented by Dr. Yunus at EHA 2016. This was their phase two trial, showing the excellent overall response rate of 66%. However, when you look at this carefully, the CR rate is fairly low, it's only 9%. And we all know from prior study with novel agents that uh, generally people who are in CR tend to have a longer PFS compared to people in PR only. And, um, in fact, the median duration of the response of this trial was showed is only about 7.8 months, so not pretty similar to what was in Brintaxin-Vadeldin. And Pembrolizumab is another, uh, another PD-1 inhibitor, and this was presented uh, at EHA this year as well, showing that overall response rate very similar to nivolumab, around 70%. The CR rate appears a little bit higher, but this was not done by independent review, just the investigator. So it's hard to argue that the CR rate was higher with this agent, for sure. Um, so in conclusion, for all the novel agents out there, uh, what we know for bentuximab, you have a five-year overall survival is 54% and PF is 22%. With the PD-1 inhibitors, we really don't know the, what the long-term outcome of these drugs are. What's reported out there shows a PFS of 69% at four months for pembrolizumab and 46% at around one year's time. And with nivolumab, they only showed a 86% at four months, again. So we don't know what the two-year, three-year PFS outcome is going to be. So it's hard to say that uh, these drugs are definitely going to prolong the patient's uh, 
survival for long term. And again, knowing that the median age of this population is only 31 years old, so if you can delay the relapse for about two years, these are still patients that really want to get on with their lives, you know. So it's very hard to say the true uh, benefit. Now, we know the reducing the adult transplant does have a longest track record. Uh, they do have complications such as GVHD, VOD infections. But just like the novel agents out there, uh, they're consistently doing trials to improve the outcome of, of uh, allo transplant, including use a haplo donor. So really, you can't argue that there's a patient out there that doesn't have a donor available anymore. And a lot of times, novel agents are used to uh, in, improve GVSD prophylaxis with allo transplant. So protease inhibitors, BTKs, JAK kinases are all in clinical trials now to improve the outcome after allo transplant. And uh, Dr. Mosk was also re uh, already beat me to the punch on this data that we show using a Brintexma as a bridge to allo transplant. This was a collaborative effort done by uh, um, the Hutch and the uh, City of Hope. We looked at 32 patients uh, who had a relapse fresh Hodgkin lymphoma who received Brintexma and then went on to a reduced and allo transplant. Well, out of the 32, 19 went to transplant. Uh, this was the patient population. Again, the median age is young, 31. And it was heavily pretreated. Five median number prior rating was five, and 18 out of 19 had received a prior auto transplant. Okay. And we show that, uh, you know, um, the two-year data, the two-year overall survival was around 79 percent. The two-year PFS is 59 percent. So this is better than most of the data out there with allo alone or with the novel agent alone as well. And we then compare this data with our prior data. So patient who received Brintaxman went to allo transplant versus patient that, ne that never had Brintaxman and got transplanted. So the outcome was better if you had received a novel therapy and went on to transplant. The two-year overall survival was 71% versus 57%. And uh, relapse rate was also lower, 24% versus 57%. Yeah. So in conclusion, really, the question to ask is what is the best strategy to combine them? allo transplant and novel agents, whether it's BV prior to allo or other things. Now we know that with the use of PD-1 inhibitors, in the both phase one trial, there were a handful of patients with uh, more severe GVAC and complications. However, those, it really was only a handful of cases. We need to see the long-term follow-up data from both of the phase two trial to really know if there are complications or true complication with the use of allo transplant after the use of PD-1 agents. Thank you very much.